Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Short Shoot Triathlon Show. My name is Will McCloy and alongside me, I have four-time world champ, Chris McCormack. I, I say that every time, Mac, we've got to get something better for you than that because I must have said that 7,000 times. What about this nice guy? Well, nice if you're guy. a nice guy, I would do it if you were nice. Like, reasonable guy, um, has a lot of pictures in the back of his shot, Chris McCormack. And uh, the woman who cannot work out how to use her own wireless in her own house, so she's in someone else's house and still doesn't really know what she's doing. <laughs> also former world number one duathlete, Annie Emerson. Annie, how are you? I'm fine. Recovering from, from an all-nighter. Listen, I, I have the utmost of respect and sympathy for you boys for when you cover uh, arena games because, my God, I was banjacked by 7 o'clock in the morning after five hours from 2 till 7 on the, the Yokohama race that I was doing for the BBC. So I've got more respect for you. I didn't have a lot before. I've got a little bit more now, OK? It's true that you didn't have a lot before if anyone's listened to any previous episodes of this show. Uh, but anyway, that's fine. And that's what we're here to talk yeah, about, well, the 11th edition. You an early of... night. You finish at three. We go all the way through, Annie, with Arena Games. We finish at four. No, no, I went to seven. I went to seven. Oh, okay. Two, two, in, two in the morning. Okay. Two to seven. Oh, no, no problems. Yeah, it wouldn't have been that long when you were doing all-nighters routinely, Annie. Come on. How long ago was that? I've done a few in my time. Oh, my God. Let's pass on that one, though, can we, quite quickly. Okay, no worries. Uh, we're going to crack straight into it because, uh, obviously, as as Annie alluded to, uh, we've just had the first WTCS race now. I'm trying to make sure I get that uh, correct. Now the World Triathlon Championship Series, it's no longer the ITU, it's World Triathlon, but it's the same old racing. Uh, we say that. We haven't really seen some racing for quite a long time, but we head back to Yokohama on the weekend for the 11th edition of that race. Uh, it's an interesting one, very flat course, very technical as well. Uh, and it was the first, you know, of the new look for this stacked field. Uh, so many questions coming in, plenty of athletes who hadn't raced for a long, long time uh, and a lot of excitement around racing. Some bizarre scenes, first of all, in the lead up. I don't know if you guys were looking at anything on Instagram or whatever, but they're all training in little odd little pods. No one was allowed to see each other. Um, I, I guess, I mean, Maka, you've probably never seen anything like that before. You know, there, it was like there was... It was like a little battery hen farm. They were all lined up one after the other on treadmills and, and on trainers. Yeah, I followed that on all the social media of a lot of the athletes. And I guess it's a great prerequisite for them for what the Olympics is going to feel like. I think Yokohama used that as a test event for the Olympic Games. And it looked tough. You know, there's a lot of athletes, you know, trying to explain what they were going through, their inability to leave their hotel room. They had to train and be back in their hotel room. You know, this is uh, – it made for an interesting build-up to the event and it made for – you know, a, a very, very difficult event to read who was going to handle that change in in preparation pre-event because, as you'll agree, Annie, most athletes are uh, stuck in their head a lot. So if things don't go the way they're used to them going for an race, it can disrupt a lot of people. So uh, I think for a lot of them going to Japan on the weekend and experiencing that was uh, was very interesting. Yeah, I think however well prepared you are, however much you've been informed about what's going to happen, I think you're absolutely right, Maka. Um, some athletes will uh, fare better at the end of that week. And I think the race uh, told a lot of stories about what had gone on. But let's not forget the athletes hadn't raced, some of them, for in that those kind of conditions, with that kind of quality field for so long. So was it the lack of racing? Was it what was going on, you know, in the week prior to the event? You know, there was a whole host of stuff that I think could have affected performances. And I don't, nothing, taking nothing away from results, you know, the guys that were on the podium, both the men and the women were outstanding. But I think we might see a different tale in, in the next races. Yeah, of course. I mean, some some athletes like a, like a Joanna Brown or a couple of others that hadn't raced since September, October 2019, which seems bizarre, uh, but a lot of them hadn't raced since October, so obviously that's a that's a big gap as well. Let's start with the women uh, as we break it down. Now there was a few outs there. It was a really it was a stacked field. Obviously everyone wants to race, but there was a lot of British women who weren't there. Georgia Taylor Brown, Vicky Holland, Jess Learmonth weren't there because they've all already qualified uh, for Tokyo. Then that, that left non Stanford and Sophie Caldwell and Beth Potter to not have to worry about the Olympic qualification. And there was also no Flora Duffy and no Ash Gentle. But it was an amazing field, and there was plenty of Olympic spots on the line, and that was that was intriguing. The little races within a race, and so for example, Yuko Takahashi, the other Japanese athletes had to finish in the top sixteen, or suddenly Taylor Nib came out of nowhere and booked her spot. Let, let's let's start with Taylor Nib because she was outstanding, and I don't think a lot of people would have tipped her prior. Um, she's been a junior world champion, under twenty three world champion, and then 
just out of nowhere, Annie, let's start with you. Um, obviously, great breakaway with Maya Kingma, who we'll talk about in a second, but then she just ran away with it and she was outstanding and she deserves to be on that plane back to Japan. Definitely. I mean, I think two points there, Will. Um, one is she is an athlete who knows how to perform. She's very young and okay, what well, she hasn't, you know, uh, done anything truly outstanding, not an Olympic distance race, but I think an event, I don't know if you'll remember this one, Macca, in Edmonton, uh, about three years ago, it was a sprint distance, but she rode away with Flora Duffy and stayed away and got second. So that was her only podium in the World Triathlon Series. But one thing all the girls say about her is she's a phenomenal biker, not technically, Technically, she wasn't great, but she's so strong. She knows how to perform. She's a two times European champion, junior, uh, world champion, sorry, not junior, world champion. And, and she knows how to perform. She really does. And she's gutsy. She knocked over two minutes off her Olympic distance 10K time. And I think that's why she was able to. Obviously, there's been a lot of improvement over the last year and a half in her run. And, and that's normal, right? Because, you know, she's an athlete that's improving. She's really young. She's 23. So we expected if she'd been doing the right tra training to have a better run. Look, she she's, it, it's surprised we're calling her a shock to the system. I think she's just matured a lot. You know, what we're seeing with this delay in the Olympics is what we've talked about a lot on the podcast is the, the opportunity for younger athletes to mature into the prospects of being an Olympic medalist, potentially. We saw it with Simon Whitfield in 2000. We saw it with with uh, Jan Frodeno in 2008. Younger athletes maturing into this Olympics. And Taylor, Taylor Nib is a, what's your second in 2015 at the Junior Worlds. She had that amazing race to win Junior Worlds again in, to win the Junior Worlds in in, in Mexico, the year the Brownleys had the wobble, she she defended that title. She went on to win the under-23 World Championships. She's a superstar, like an absolute superstar. We've been hearing about her talent for many, many years coming out of the US, but it's been clouded or shadowed by the fact that you've got, in the elites, Katie Zafaris, you've got Taylor Spivey, you had Kirsten Kaspar. You, you've got a, a, a huge depth within the women's US women's racing team. So I don't think she saw herself as a potential Olympian come Tokyo. But that delayed Olympics and the opportunity to race in Yokohama and showcase what she's been doing in Boulder, Colorado with Kirsten Casper in training. She comes from an Ironman family. Her mother made her watch Ironman videos when she was a kid. So she's grew up in that American non-drafting style of racing and, and the Iron Kids racing and has come through that high performance program. And she is a superstar and she is a winner. She reminds me of Flora Duffy in the way she attacks these races and what a performance in Yokohama. It was, it was beautiful to watch, really was. Yeah, she certainly made it look uh, very easy in the end, but it, it was not at all. She she had a breakaway uh, on the bike with Maya Kingber, and I think they we worked really well together. Uh, you notice that um, you know Maya's got some good power, Taylor's got, uh, and, and there's all those technical paces through the course, which it really helped them, and they they swap back and forth really well, and they put two minutes into the pack, which is an incredibly impressive uh, effort to then run away with a such a quick ten k off the back of it, um, but. That I want to ask both of you, at that point in the race, when, say, they're 30 seconds ahead, do you think there's no way they're going to make this stick, they're going to do with Jonas Schomburg and come back to the pack? Or did you did you see it play out the way it did uh, and for them to consistently put so much time in, Annie? You know what? It didn't totally surprise me. Um, the bike course was, oh, wow, it just seemed a bit complicated. And that kind of bit where, where that was the year now, it was through a car park. They'd obviously had to rebuild the whole course compared to different years because of COVID. Um, and I think that the reason they were so good together was that Nib was incredibly strong um, and Maya was really good through the technical sections. I don't know if you saw, Maka, that Nib got dropped several times but Maya uh, had the sense to to wait for her she knew she was going to be better off with Nib and to be honest with you um I didn't call Nib running as well as she did but I did think they would stay away when they had 30 seconds you know the main pack they were messy they weren't coming together you know they were a big pack by that stage and in that kind of course it's so hard to get everyone working together right Maka? Without, without question, and, and on that Yokohama course, and they changed that back section, as you said, it was a lot more technical. It's much better to be in a smaller group. So those two athletes away, even even in those, as you correctly saw, even with, with Maya Kimma being so much more technically astute than Taylor, they were able to stay together, get those gaps on the open road, and that bigger group was too slow for that technical section. It reminded me a lot, and we keep talking about the old days, but if, if, it, if I reflect on that World Championships in Queenstown, same thing happened. It was about 2003. It was for the selection for the Athens Olympic Games. 
and the, or was it 2002? One, one of the years. And, um, and a lot of teams were vying for Olympic selection. So there's opportunities for athletes to get away. And if you recall, Olivia Marceau and Peter Robertson got away in the men's race that day because everyone else backed on, let those two athletes go. They're not going to disrupt my Olympic selection. And when no one's chasing down groups, it, it makes for all these races within a race happening. So I know the American women were watching Taylor up the road thinking, if she gets on the podium here, she's going to the Olympic Games. And I think they backed the fact that they thought they'd, they'd outrun her. I don't think they believe the gap would get out as big as it did. And she did run exceptionally well. She looked very, very controlled. She ran with the maturity of a of an Olympic distance racer. She didn't push that early first five five kilometres of that run. And she just looked, looked spectacular. I, I think... With Flora Duffy coming in for the Olympics, with her showing that form, her youthful exuberance and her talent as a young junior, she could do something pretty special come Olympic Games. I know I'm getting ahead of myself. A lot of people didn't race. But just how composed she was to to win a WTS event against that type of field in that way is very, very classy. Yeah, very, very good time to do it as well. And it sets up a really intriguing situation for the US women's team because Summer Rappaport had an outstanding run, it has to be said, ran away from the pack, eventually uh, ran down Kingmer and ended up making it a US 1-2. And then you've got this situation now where there's one spot left and you've got Katie Zafiris, 2019 world champion, had a difficult day, uh, finished 22nd. Taylor Spivey finished fourth. Kirsten Casper was there or thereabouts, finished at the back of that pack and finished 14th. Who goes to the Olympic Games? Do you leave out Katie Zafira? She's obviously had a, um, a difficult time in the last couple of months with her father passing away. Do you pick Spivey? Do you pick Casper? What do you do? Annie, go first. What, who, who do you pick? Well, I have to say that I think it's, a travesty that she hasn't been picked already. Mm. You know, she's such a talented athlete. She's meticulous in her preparation. Just look at her results from 2019, the way she's gradually built up and improved um, throughout her career. You know, she's a big time performer. Um, and you, you've got to remember, there'll be Duffy there. There'll be Jess Learmont, you know, and I think, as you said, you know, she's had such a tough time over the last few weeks. She lost her dad and it was totally unexpected. So training's been disrupted. She had to go back to the States and then back again. Um, You can't not give her a spot. Spivey is a brilliant athlete. But for me, she's a top five, you know, Olympics, top seven. You know, Katie Sephiris is, you know, for me, one of the favourites to take gold. You cannot leave her out. I mean, that performance, I'd I'd love to speak to her to find out, you know, what actually went on in the swim from the start. She was miles back. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Maka? Yeah, look, look, she, as you said, she lost her father four weeks ago. She, she's left training camp. She, she came back. She didn't. She wouldn't have been on this start list if she didn't have to be there, right? And, and I agree. She she should have been pre-selected. She's the world champion. She's finished, what, fourth, third, second, first in the world championship series over the last four years. Like, she is a standout. Two, 18 months ago, prior to the Olympics being moved, she was the talk of guaranteed gold medal, right? Like, it was Katie Zafaris is going to the Olympics and going to win gold. They will pick her. If they don't, I'll be, I'll be mortified. I love Taylor Spivey. Unfortunately, Olympic times... Taylor Nibb has put herself in the team according to the selection criteria and someone has to miss out and and someone who's more than capable of being a big time performer in the Olympics and probably worthy of a spot. But that's what the Olympic Games is. There can be only two or there can be only three. And in this case, only three will be selected. Two are gone. You have to take Katie Zafaris. You have to give her that time to prep. She's got 10 more weeks to get over, to get back into training camp, to do what she she does. And as you said, when you bring in Flora Duffy, and, and Jess Learmont and, and and even GTB, Georgia Taylor-Brown and, and these big swimmers, that group up front, and Taylor Nibb is starting to get very, very strong. And I see those three American women with the three English women leading that front group. It's going to be a shootout on an amazing run. And uh, I think you've got to pick Katie Zafaris. Sorry, Taylor, I think you're very worthy of a spot. Taylor Spivey I'm talking to, but you have to take Katie. Yeah, sometimes it's just an embarrassment of riches, isn't there? There is in the UK team as well. And there's three, there's three women there who who definitely figure, and you saw a non-Stanford figure, is that she already got ruled out. Um, but, you know, this is the vagaries of it. And I just, while you were talking, I just got Katie Zafiris' uh, Instagram up and because uh, I read the caption today. It just said, resilience, resiliency check complete. I always knew this race was going to be challenging, even in the best of circumstances. It was a bit sooner than I was ready for, but it was something I needed to do. The thing about a place number, no matter what the place is, is that it never reveals the whole journey. It makes me feel like it's not me. 
and another part is proud of that number. So all is there within me and I know this. Onwards we go as the journey continues and you, you would have said this is, I wouldn't even call it a bump in the road. It was just obviously the best that she could deliver on the day and um, and Japan and Yokohama certainly sorted a few athletes out in that respect and she's certainly been on a journey. Maka, I want to talk to you before we keep going along but about Maya Kingma. I know that she, you know, she's a part of MX Endurance. You've, you've watched her for a long time. Uh, she's never won a medal on the on the on the WTCS or the WTS as it used to be called um, but she was so gutsy on that bike and then to hang on um, you know Nib ran so well that she, it wasn't if she was running slowly and uh, Summer Rappaport was running like the T1000 uh, but to hold on for the bronze uh, that's a big moment for her as well in the context of where her career is at uh, and coming into Tokyo. Oh, huge, huge moment for Maya. Huge moment. I think she she's really built a lot of confidence off the back of the Arena Games. We first saw her in Super League racing at our first Rotterdam race at the Arena Games. She comes from a huge swimming background. She does a lot of work on her bike riding, and, and I think she's maturing as a triathlete. And there was always a lot of promise with Maya Kinmer as, as an athlete. And I think, as we're starting to see, when, you, when you're doing more of these Super League races, when you're racing your peers, week in, week out, and they haven't had the opportunity to race a lot over the last 18 months, but Super League has provided that opportunity. May has jumped at that opportunity. I think she just seemed very, very relaxed. In races prior, I've seen her compete. She seemed to get flustered when she hasn't been able to escape on the bike, and she seems to head down as she runs out of transition. She knows she's not a huge runner, so she doesn't have that running confidence. But I thought she bound out of transition in Yokohama with, with, with a lot more confidence. She seemed to find a rhythm. She let that gap open up. And she was worthy of that podium position. And, and I think for a lot of athletes, sometimes they're breakthrough moments and you get a result like that and you can you can sort of stack on top of that and build a, a career off a breakthrough race. Where Prior to that, she's probably been second guessing whether she has the arsenal to, to be a front of the pace racer. Now she knows she can. I think the sky's the limit for Maya. I think with that swim bike combination, she can be a very opportunistic opportunistic racer with the Flora Duffies and the Jess Learmonts and being in that group and being able to, to work with them to get that gap and shoot out with eight women as opposed to 50 women at the Olympic Games. Yeah, let's talk about not just not just King, but there's a, there's a bunch of athletes who, who probably didn't put their best foot forward in this race as well uh, that we want to look back further along. I mean, I mean, you go back, fifth was Julia Hauser. She booked a ticket to Tokyo, so that's awesome for Austria. But then you look at, a, say, Laura Lindemann was quite far back and Leonie Perio had a well, she just made a mistake coming out of T1 and end up DNFing. You know, we didn't see like the likes of Cassandra Beaugrand ended up finishing 10th, but she was on in that pack and she always, you know, you always think, okay, she's going to have an extra gear. Didn't necessarily happen on the day. When you go to Japan and you have not your best day and then you know you've got to go back there in 10 weeks' time, I mean, how hard is that mentally to, to do that on the biggest stage and you go, well, I'm going to leave Japan. I'm going to come straight back. I'm going to remember what happened 10 weeks ago and I'm going to try and put that out of my head. I mean, there's a few athletes who probably didn't do what they thought they could have done on that day. Annie, we'll start with you. Well, I think, you know, it's a, you only had to look at the colour of some of the girls to know that they hadn't been in the sun. You looked at Laura Lindemann and she was pasty white. And I mean, how do you do that? To, to have spent all of your, your winter prep in the northern in, in northern Europe, um, and and turn up at a race where it's thirty degrees. You know the sun's you know absolutely spanking down on you. So I don't think it was a big surprise. The girls are going to be able to have more options to, as to where they can go and train. I imagine that they'll all be going to the heat somewhere, and it will be a different story uh, in Tokyo. But I think you're right. You know you, they're going to have to work hard to put that negativity aside and that bad result and you know what's it's hard hard to do that i think they will be able to yeah i, I tend to i tend to agree and, and you, when you're talking about a lot of the athletes in that top 10 you know lindemann's already qualified for germany she's already on the team so there's a lot of athletes there that don't have that desperation of olympic qualification which was definitely hanging over that american team you could you could feel the tension amongst them and you know cassandra Bogran is is she just doesn't have that endurance yet to be a, a true Olympic distance racer. She's just still too young. And we say, I mean, I say that, yeah, Taylor Nib goes and wins the event. But we've always questioned Cassandra's ability to run a, a solid 10K. I think if it was a sprint distance race, it would have been a very, very different story. But I thought she had a great race, Cassandra, to finish in that top 10. She hung tough for a lot of that run, but just started to drift off in that back end endurance. But I will say it was 30 degrees in Yokohama, 29, 30 degrees. It's going to be four or five degrees hotter come July. So it's a completely different. And 
the humidity wasn't so high in Yokohama. We're only talking about 60, 70% humidity. So come Tokyo in, in 10 weeks' time, completely different race and a lot hotter. But also don't forget, Mac, that the, the race was at lunchtime, which was pretty cruel on the athletes. So the Olympic distance race, at the, at the, at the Olympics in Tokyo, both the men and the women's will be at half past six oh, in the morning. Good. But yeah, it's still going to be. It's still going to be absolutely scorching hot, but I think the athletes will be much more prepared for it. Am I yeah, right? right that the test event was not at that time of the morning, no? The test event was later in the day, wasn't it? Because it was 32 degrees plus when they did that. So why would they have, why would they have the test event at a different time of day? To, I might be wrong, but you think they'd have it at the same oh, time. It's the Olympics, Will. If you're looking for common sense, you're talking the wrong organisation. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah fair enough uh there was a few athletes as well who got a bit ill from the water too i mean the water looked beautiful until they dived into the water and then you're like oh no no i don't like that at all jake Bertwist was one uh, i spoke to him after the race and he he swallowed a bit of water the previous day and that was enough to put him out of the race and uh well we'll get we'll get to the men's as well in a minute but um interesting times to get a taste of or a literal taste of what it's going to be like to try to uh, to race in Japan in ten weeks. So let's let's go to the men's. Um, the big news here, the big news, the news that I did not even expect was that Vincent Lewis is a human person, and it's the first time that he's seen the back of any other athlete since September two thousand and nineteen in Lausanne, which was a win to Christian Blumenfeld, which happened again in this race. And he he just said Vincent, and we'll start with Vincent. He just didn't have the energy. So he's like, I'm really happy with sixth on a bad day. Um, but he just he didn't have it there. But having spoken to him on this podcast in the last episode, go back and listen to it if you haven't already. I thought he was primed to just continue. Like he, he just sounded like he had not missed a session, that he was on fire. Um, and then the guys that he trains with, like Yella Gaines and Martin Van Riel, were just going to just... They were just going to show all their weapons straight away. It, that didn't happen in the end, but... Vince, probably if he's going to have an off day, Maka, this is a good day to have it. Yeah, without question. I, I think what I noticed in particular about that race, I thought Vincent swam magnificently. He had the outside as, as the number one starter. He had the far left of the pontoon and, and Schumann was on the inside of him. But what was missing, and, and, and uh, it was very, very obvious, and even when you look at last year's racing, even though he didn't perform as well, he was a big part of shaping the race, was Alistair Brown he was missing. And that group that got away, without without a without a leader on the road or a doyon of that pack, which Alistair is, take away his racing, but take away when you think of Alistair as a racer, he gets out of that water, he he communicates with his peers, he's he, he's aggressive in his communication, he organizes those. <laughs> is that what you call it? But communication. He is. He yells at everyone around. He yells him. At every, but he gets everyone organized and people listen. And and those groups stay away. Go back and watch the Rio Olympic Games. He went top to bottom on that first climb with his brother. He split that group. He distanced. Richard Murray and, and, and Mario Mola, who were the two athletes he thought could beat him in, in Rio, he got that gap. And I don't think they were as organised in Yokohama. With, without someone on the road taking that initiative up, that should have been Vincent Louis, and he didn't do it. It's one thing to come around and do your turn, but if you're not driving your, your peers to work for a common interest, then the groups are going to come together. And Christian Blumenfeld was able to come in and close in on that group and, and come in. And, and Christian is the type of athlete that just... You just look at his face when he races. He's giving 110% every time he pins on a number and he just runs people off their feet. And I, I just thought they were in danger when that group came together and people start to question their ability to, you know, question where they position themselves as so they get off the bike in a transition, question the pace as they run out. And I, I just thought with, with Brownlee missing and Johnny not on form, Alex G stood up for the for the UK and, and, and moved up on them. But Christian was... You know, I loved his interview after the after the event. I looked around and it was easy. And it really did look easy for Christian Blumenfeld. He did not look like he got out of second or third gear and uh, he jogged to a, a very, very convincing win. And for Vincent, I think he'll – it's nice to get a – I think sometimes it's nice to get a defeat. You get that out of the way. Now you go back to the drawing board. You prep for, for the Olympics with, with your training group. At least the group that you're training with finished in front of you at, 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 at the Yokohama event and you come into – you come into Tokyo a little with a little bit le- with a little bit of vulnerability, which I think at times can be a good thing. So I expect more from him in Tokyo, and don't take the Yokohama event as a, a precursor for the results of the Olympic Games. 
Yeah, it was odd, wasn't it? He just he was willing to just sit mid pack almost the entire bike. He had a few turns at the front at the beginning, and then I just kept looking for the Phoenix logo every shot. And then it was just he was probably back at about tenth, and he never. Maybe he just did have that day. He just had that day where, but his swim was so good. As soon as I saw him swimming, I was like, "Oh, that's it. It's over." He's just so smooth in the water. Um, but I, I like I like that you Macca prefer. I know what your you know thoughts on government are. Like you prefer a dictatorship to a democracy. A dictatorship gets stuff done. Like shit gets done during dictatorship. Alistair will tell you what to do. Without Alistair tell you what to do, everyone was like, well, we vote to just stay together and then nothing happened. And then how long has it been since we've seen 40 blokes on the bike together, like at the front? It, it just, yeah, it was very strange. It's pre-Brownlee days. The last time we've seen it is pre-Brownlee days. It was when, when Alistair Brownlee and his brother Johnny came, they two boys single-handedly ripped these fields apart. And a lot of the athletes, have, a lot of the male athletes have grown up in that era and when you take Ali out of the mix, he, he did it in Hamburg last year. He did it in Valencia last year. Okay, he didn't have the run legs to run over the top of Vincent, but he he engaged those breakaways and organised that group. And people like Vincent and that respect Alistair enough to, t- to take to allow him to be the doyon of the, the leader on the road and, and to, to, to take control of the group. There needs to be someone, a swimmer, who's prepared to do that come Tokyo. If not, you're going to have a shootout with some very big runners, including Mario Mola, including Alex Yee, including Christian Blumenfeld and, and and many others. So for the swimmers out there, if you want to win the Olympics, go back and watch the Rio games and look what Alistair and Johnny did. And that's the strategy you need to implement come Tokyo. Well, maybe we have a power vacuum. Who steps into that vacuum? It's got to, like, it's got to be someone like a Vince. Like it, he might look back at that or he might listen to this and go, well, maybe I need to control people. Or maybe I need to tell people a little bit more what to do. I mean, is that – I mean, you guys have got more – vast more experience than anyone you know, than I do on this like is is everyone just looking at each other at that point and that's why the pace came off Annie or and and, and should it be Vince should he be like well maybe I needed to take that by the scruff of the neck and I didn't well I, I mean I think that um Mac has nailed it you know that there's not a lot more you can add you're absolutely right you know Alistair changes races he has done all of his life Martin Van Riel who raced so well at the arena games you know he was up there right at the front down on the tri bars absolutely hammering the pace which is what the athletes need to do in those first five kilometers but what he didn't do was kind of rally the troops he's too nice a guy you know Alistair's out there absolutely giving them yeah. you know and you know you either stay on or you get off because you're too scared if you can't pull your turn you know we've seen it before um who could be in there Jonas Schumberg you know he's so strong on the bike but he's not racing intelligently at the moment I don't think because I do think he has the legs to to get stuck in there and you know in those first five kilometers you know take over from where Alistair is you know get together these guys that know they're going to be out of the swim first need to be talking together before the race yeah. because you you, we were talk, you were talking about the runners there. Well, look at look at what um, Yellow Games did. He is a major threat come Tokyo if he's anywhere near the front. You know, and he was angry at the end of the race that he hadn't won. I don't know if you guys saw his uh, post race interview, but I sort of was like. Oh, steady. You know, he, he said, I've got Christian Blumenfeld's number now. You know, he was a great actor. You know, he was acting as though he was hurting when he wasn't. But I know his game now. And basically, he was saying, I'm coming after him. You know, Yellow Gaines is one of those small, compact little athletes that will deal well with the heat come Tokyo. And that 10 kilometers, if he's anywhere near the front, he's going to be a huge threat for a medal. Yeah. I like the way he did that. I like the, I like when people tell the truth about how they're actually thinking at the end of a race like that. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't do that to Christian. Christian, he's four times the size of Yellow Games. Like, I would run into him at the buffet afterwards. But, um, yeah, well, at least he said what he said. I mean, he's like, I was doing too much of the work. And then Christian was sitting in and then he's saying he was hurting and then he never was. And then afterwards he said, oh, that was the easiest. I felt more control on the run than I ever felt. It just He just looks like he's in so much pain. He's like the Lionel Sanders of short course triathlon. Like he's not fluid at all. He's just power and limbs and anger, and I think that, which is awesome to watch. But yeah, I, I like that. But was he really telling the truth about that was easy? Because I don't know about you guys, but there were some pretty close up shots from the cameraman on the bikes, which we saw them getting too close on quite a few occasions. But right at the end, with about a kilometre to go, you said, Maka, you know, he just looked like a man absolutely possessed. And he really did. It was almost, almost like he was running, not scared, angry. But it did look like he was kind of giving it his all at that place. And I love the way he doesn't back off. He doesn't look around and go, I've got this one. He keeps on hammering forward. 
he doesn't let anyone else in once once he's gone. Yeah, you you follow any follow the Norwegians on on Instagram, and they're they're, they're animals. The way they train, the way they the way they prep, and their their sheer belief in their ability. They are as far as they're concerned, the Olympics is a foregone conclusion. It, it's uh, no one else is buying into the story. That's that's they're shocked that no one else believes it. That we're talking about Vincent Louis and we're talking about other people, Christian Blumenfeld and 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 the Norwegians are just laughing at us, thinking you'll see, come Tokyo, then you'll 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 believe the story. And and we just know the way Vince, um, the way that Christian Blumenfeld will race. He has a weaker swim; they need to exploit that. But he swam magnificently in Yokohama, I thought. But there, if there's any kink in his armour, it's the weaker swim and he's a little bit stiff out of the corners on the bike, but he positions well. But the one thing he's going to do is use his, his size to muscle his way in to get good transitions. He'll hit the gas as he runs out of, out, of, out of the run and he's prepared to run flat out from start to finish. He's not, he's not really a tactician to some degree. He just applies so much pressure until people break and that's what makes him an exciting athlete to follow. I believe they're a vulnerable athlete coming to Olympic Games if you can run off the back of that. And I always thought Vincent Louis would would use Christian as a as a pacer almost and know that he has a devastating kick finish to 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 give a knockout punch come Olympic Games. But there is so many others, as we saw with Gellens and and, and I even thought um, um, Alex Yee's 10K was magnificent for a for athlete. Yeah, really, really, really composed, a, a magnificent run. And I. I I got the feeling he started thinking more about I got my Olympic spot here as opposed to winning the race. I know it's not a guaranteed Olympic spot, but in my head he just seemed to be checking everybody as opposed to running the way Alex usually runs, which is hit the front, apply the pressure, yeah, and, and run away with it. I think he was more content. I'm first British athlete. Um, I'm on the podium here. you got to pick me for the Olympics. You have to pick me for the Olympics. Great mm. relay racer, and here's my 10K to prove it. So. I'd hate to be a selector right now for, for, for many of these national federations because there's going to be some, some hot athletes sitting on the sidelines, that's for sure. Oh, there really is. It's actually ridiculous. I mean, and let's not forget that the Yellow Gains was delivered to the front of the pack by Gustav Eden, we should also point out, because his bike was so outstanding and he, has, he doesn't shy away from that at all. So unlike last time all three of them were on the podium together and they only had two flags, I heard that in commentary, they had to borrow a Norwegian flag from a fan to put them up at the top of the podium. They'll have three Norwegian flags just in case uh, when we get to to Japan. But a, a good a good point you, you, you put up there on Alex Yee. Um, obviously, he finished fourth. Tom Bishop finished 20-something. Johnny slowed down to let him get an extra couple of points. And he... What are we... But I guess they didn't do a whole lot to get that third spot. I mean, they're still trying to get that third spot so Alistair Brownlee right now sits in 90th position in the uh, the Olympic qualification rankings. Yi is 32nd, Bishop 37th. The selection meeting is set for two days after Leeds uh, to decide who is going to be in there. Let's hope that that two or three spots is decided by then. If it's not, I'm sure that meeting is going to get put back. But what what happens now? Because Johnny is there. Alex Yi comes fourth. As you said, he auditioned. He's obviously, we're going to think about the mixed team relay. He's he's a guy. Then you've got Bishop and you've got Brownlee, who's actually behind two other Brits down in ninetieth. So what do you what do you do? What's the plan? <laughs> because it's just a little. It's it's more complicated than Katie Zafiris because you're going to leave out the guy that's won all the Olympics for the last eight years. Is a very brave call to make by any federation, regardless of how well anyone else is going, just purely because they can defend the selection of Alistair Brownlee much better than if Alex G has a bad day. So what what do you do? Well, Australia did it to the great Emma Snowsill. So if there's any idiotic nation in the world, you're looking at one in Australia because they left they left the greatest triathlete of all, female triathlete I'd ever seen, off her second Olympic team, and she was number five in the world. So don't think a guaranteed, because you've got a gold medal, you get a guaranteed slot. Selectors think very, very differently. I think you're nuts leaving Alistair Brownlee off, but I can't. I can't fault Alex Yee. So I would not want to be in the shoes of selectors because they both deserve an, of a spot. And and what what Alistair will bring to that men's race may go against the the momentum of the British team. And and that's that's what they need to look at. He may support a breakaway that, that ultimately benefits a Vincent Louis and, and, and others. But where Alex with a group coming together, he has that big run. We know that 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 Alistair doesn't have those run legs anymore that, that Alex will have. 
you know, I I I would personally pick. Oh, I'm not going to even say it. Say it. Say it. Say it. We need the headline. Come on, man. You would pick Alex Yee over Alistair Brownlee. I would put. I said on the last podcast I'd pick Alistair Brownlee, but I only because I have questioned Alex Yee's 10K. I just thought he's a bit young and maturing into it. But I thought he's the best relay racer for GB. I think Great Britain has a big chance of winning that relay with the women that they've got and the men's field with Alex Yee on it. And he's good enough to win the event. And it's hot. He's small. I think you pick Alex Yee and you leave Alistair Brownlee off. Sorry, Ali. Three Olympics is fantastic. Ali, would you like to double down? Oh, do you know what? It's funny because when we when we were chatting previously about it and I was almost suggesting, no, we don't take Alistair, listening to you talk about how influential he is in that bike pack, what he can do. But then that is going to really go against mm. the team if they ride away and they leave Alex Yee behind, because I know people don't like talking about sizes, but let's talk about it. Alex Yee is a really slim figure. He's perfect for the kind of conditions that the athletes are going to be hit with in Tokyo. He's incredibly lean and small, um, and he can deliver as he did um, on on Saturday night or Friday night or whenever it was. Um, 10 seconds faster he ran this year to last year. But you know what? This year was much tougher because running from the front is a lot harder than it is from chasing people down you know and I and I think you're right I mean he managed to run quicker than last year but I thought he was suffering a little bit but then I think we have to point out that was his only his fourth Olympic distance race on the world triathlon series or the world what is it called now <laughs> the world's world championship world triathlon series. championship series come on I'm sorry, sorry. Um, I haven't recovered from Friday night and no sleep yet. But um, yeah, I mean, he, you know, running from the front, I think you're absolutely right, Mac. It was a, a magnificent performance and he's only going to get stronger. That is a guy who can deliver under pressure because let's not forget, he took the national title, a huge race um, in, in London a couple of years ago when he won the 10,000 metres. And I haven't got the time here, but it was under 28 minutes. That guy's not afraid. He was in of, the 28, of, I think. Yeah. No, just it was just 27, under 28. 27, um, 2741. 27. Yeah. And, and, and he, he can deliver under pressure. Yeah. The best solution is the Brits need three spots because you can't leave Alistair Brownlee on the sidelines, right? And I'm only saying if you've got a two-person team for the men, you need to back that relay. You have to you have to have faith in that relay as well and you need to take Alex. If it's a two-person team, Alex G should be selected over Alistair. I apologise, Alistair. I think you're the greatest to ever do the distance and you're deserving of a spot, but it's not, you only got, if you only get two selections and you're not deserving of a spot. But if they get that third spot, Alistair Brownlee needs to come, lead that team, help his brother and, and work as almost what Stewie Hayes was for them in London. He, he almost needs to fill that. Or does he help, or does he help Alex Yee? I mean, I love, I'm lo I love Johnny. I'm a huge fan of him, but he will admit he seems to be able to run. He had a, a magnificent 5K a few weeks back, um, but he just doesn't seem to have the legs off the bike at the moment. So does Alistair work for, for Alex to, to guarantee GB? Oh, can, you know, we, can we even envisage that would happen with Alistair no. Brownlee working for Alex Yee? No, <laughs> surely not. <laughs> or for anyone else? Alistair Brownlee is there to win a gold medal, man. He's got two golds. You know, like he, that's why he's got two golds. But we, need, but, we, but we need to pick up on the fact that Alistair is carrying another injury, yeah. you know, another ankle injury. It's always, you know, the lower legs with him, unfortunately. And I don't know the extent of the injury, but he is injured and I'm not sure if he's even running at the moment. And it's, we're 10 weeks out, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's a hard pick. It's a hard pick. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a, it's not up to us, so that's fine. We just get to throw pot shots from the sidelines at whatever they decide to do because it'll be very easy to do that uh, because it's it's an impossible choice. Um, now, one man who did book his spot, and we talk about running from the back versus running from the front, Morgan Pearson. How oh, about yeah. Morgan Pearson? Ran a 102 half recently, so he could, he's got wheels, but he ran his he's 35th, I think, off the bike and ran his way through the field for the first for his first podium and to book a spot in Tokyo. And he was just mowing people, even in the last kilometre. I just thought everyone was quick, but he just had an extra, uh, something extra in his bowl of muesli that morning because he was on fire. Yeah, he's well, he comes from a big running background. He transitioned after the, was after Rio Olympics into, into triathlon, thought he could make the Olympics, and he's done just that. He's a, what, a 13 and a half 5K runner, uh, a, a big collegiate running background. 
Uh, he won. He's been winning a couple of the World Cups last year, I think, from memory, or the year before. He, he sort of came in the. He's been coming into into, I guess, his form. He was a shock, surprise to me. I didn't think he'd have he'd run all the way through and put book his book his spot on the Olympic team. But that's why the Olympics is pretty cool. That you know, when it's clear cut, do this and you go. I I, I do like that that way of of selecting teams. Everybody everybody's on an evil even keel and you know what it takes to make an Olympics and and he did everything that was required and asked of him he's been prepping for him I follow him on Instagram for the last you know six months or so and he's been saying it that he's in great form he's he's prepped well he lost his older brother um so another tragedy within the US his his older brother passed away and he's he seemed to have risen from that saying I'm going to do it for him and I'm going to the Olympic Games and everybody laughed I see even Cameron Worth having a few jokey pot shots at him a few months ago um, about his swim form in the pool, and uh, he was just like, "We'll see, come Olympic time," and and good on him. He's put himself on the US Olympic team, which is uh, which is marvelous. Yeah, absolutely. What a performance! We didn't we didn't expect it. He came from absolutely nowhere. Um, really emotional interview at the end there. Hey, I didn't know the story about his brother, but um, but he's calm. He he's he does he has to sort of almost like slightly different demeanor compared to the other American athletes and I think as you said like looking at him on Instagram I've seen a few posts of him he's a bright guy you know he kind of knows what he's doing but what a run and that's 60 62 half it's sort of what about four minutes off the the world record um for half marathon and you just think how does he run that fast I don't think anyone else would get close to that kind of time um in in the world triathlon series at the moment he swims well for a runner like I, I mean for a guy who's transitioned from a pure running background to triathlon, I was expecting to see a clumsy swimmer with, and he actually swims quite nice. He, he a lot of the swimming in in the United States is in those twenty five yard pools, which, you know, they always talk about sub fifty eights and fifty nines. I'm like, dude, it's yards, man. Let's talk meters like the rest of the world. But he's swimming sub, you know, fifty eight second hundred yard sprints, which is it's nice swimming for a for a for a runner. And he was doing that six months ago. So I remember thinking, okay, if this guy gets some clear water and and if the groups come together and he positions himself, he reminds me of a Peter. I keep bringing up Peter Robertson, but very, very similar style of, of athlete. In the, in, if if the race unfolds the way it, the race unfolds and the run, the groups come together and it can come down to a running shootout. You don't bet against those guys because they've got too much running pedigree to 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 bet against. So one last stat, and we're going to wrap it up soon. But so I was just looking in the men's race and I looked down the list of the top ten. Nine Super League triathlon athletes in the top ten from Yokohama. Uh, only Pearson is the, the he's the uh, he's the sole soldier because Yellow Gaines is going to join us uh, in September, um, which means that we cover the entire top ten and only Morgan Pearson, who we should probably give a wild card to, uh, <laughs> just to make the to- just to make like round it out. Um, does and, and I guess that speaks a little bit to yes, it's a, it's an Olympic distance race, it's completely different racing, but when you look at there's some athletes that were fantastic and then we brought them into Super League, but there's other athletes who have become better because of Super League and then booked their place in the top 10. Like, Macker, and I want to, I guess we direct this one at you. I mean, it's been four years now since Super League began and it's changed immeasurably since we did the first one in Hamilton Island. But when you look at a race like that where people are uh, earning Olympic qualifications and everything's on the line, et cetera, et cetera, and then you look at, the number of athletes that have been a part of the Super League series and for how long. You must be proud, first of all, of like just what an impact Super League has had on triathlon in all its forms. Because we've got athletes as well, like a Blumenfeld, et cetera, who and like a Vincent who's gone on to do 70.3. And like all all of all forms of swim, bike and run have been affected in some way by what Super League has brought and changed. Yeah, I think the great thing, you know, when we we launched Super League. What what my my vision was, and not so much a vision, but what I was hoping would happen, and it actually has happened. It was there was sort of a semi move away from for the athlete from from the confines of of a national federation. With you know traveling with a national team, you could be your own person and prep on your own and come in and be part of a part of a racing series of substance with your peers. But it mattered. You know, most other races, athletes tend to go, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's not my A race. And my A race is a WTS in Leeds or this one. Super League matters. And then by shortening the distance and refining and by making each discipline almost the same length of time as the other, it makes sure that athletes with any weakness in a single discipline are quickly exploited. So Super League refined, you know, brought the cream of the crop to the top, 
refined their transitions, refined the way they race, refined their skills, and they're able to correlate that. When, I, when they walk across to Olympic distance racing right now, it must feel like an Olympic distance racer going to Ironman. You know, they jog out of transition, be like, oh, this is a, br- a breeze. And everyone's clumsy in, in transition and you're – you're in and out. If you look at those Super League athletes, particularly on the men's race after swim, because I was watching that in particular, all of our guys, all of the Super League guys were boom, 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 and you see a lot of the others stumbling and fumbling in transition. Well, I took a lot of solace from that and thought, we've done a good thing, and I think it's only going to be, we talked about on the last podcast, it's going to become a time where you, you start to talk about those athletes that are in Super League and those that aren't, and it's going to be a, a very, very clear difference on the way they perform. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and obviously, then we're going to get to post-Tokyo and the, all this pressure and, of National Federation pressure is going to disappear. And we're going to see some really interesting racing where they can just let their ego shine for a whole month long. And and then we can make Annie just, you know, chase around after him. It's going to be fantastic. I mean, how good is that going to be? Annie, I mean, obviously, you're going to be in and amongst it. I mean, these athletes, they feel the pressure so much of the national federations and especially coming into what has now been an Olympic two years of waiting and then to have all of that stripped away and just be able to do exactly what they want and not have to race under any orders or do anything in specific is going to be fun to watch. I mean, I think you're so right, Maka. I mean, I like I don't want to talk about myself. I'm a bloody you know old person. I retired 15 years ago, but I remember that pressure. And okay, I, I never made the Olympics, but I remember a horrible pressure from Federation. And to be able, and it's not you know it, times have changed. You know, British triathlon is amazing. They look after their athletes brilliantly. You know, definitely not criticizing them at all. But it is big pressure to go out there and perform, and, and all eyes are on you you know and they have such big teams these days it's nutritionists it's physios it's coaches it's performance directors I mean the list of the team members is absolutely endless and they go and, and as you said Maka they go to Super League and they can be their own people they can take their ego they can be the real person that they are they are without feeling that they're kind of being watched a little bit um, and I think you know the feedback from all of the athletes um, you know from Arena Games is you know just how fun it is just you know it is so team TV friendly, spectator friendly. It's just so brilliant to watch. Um, and in really exciting times, I think you're absolutely right. Get the Olympics over and done with. It's only the Olympics. No, I'm joking. But then move on to September. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of these athletes are going to be really excited to race, I think, you know. They really are. I can't, we can't wait to bring it to you. In the meantime, uh, keep tuned to the Short Shoot Triathlon Show. Uh, we're going to have plenty more coming up. We're going to talk after the next couple of World Cups. It's going to be packed. Like You should see the start list for Lisbon and then uh, Kenya and then we go to Mexico. All the start lists are amazing. It's going to be some great racing over the next month or so as people fight for Olympic spots. We're going to wrap all that up on the show. Maka, uh, Annie, thank you so much for joining us. We hope uh, out there the listeners have enjoyed wherever they are sitting on their tur- turbo or um, I saw someone who was it the other day, uh, all the Walsh just went for a 60, 60 minute ride, then got the train home. So if you're on the train home after you've gone for a ride and you've gotten sick of it halfway through and got on the train to come home again, oh, we hope you've enjoyed the podcast guys. Thank you so much. Cheers. Always a pleasure. Good thank you. you. Yeah, it's good. Out. Well, I'd say it's good to get out of the house. I'm not getting out. I'm in my bedroom, <laughs> but you know, It's good to see you while I'm in my bedroom. That's a pretty weird thing to say. Um, But thank you so much, both of you. Annie, thanks for going to find some better wireless. That's so much better for us. Uh, And everyone else, we'll see you next time.